My name is Mike Green. Uh, I am a NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory Solar System Ambassador volunteer. And it says over there. Uh, I, this is one of my, uh, once again, my live presentations at the Wayne Library. I did several in 2019 and pre-COVID days. This is my first live one, hopefully in the post-COVID time. And uh, I hope you do enjoy it. The title is uh, Passing the Torch from the Apollo generation that I believe we are all part of uh, to the new Artemis generation. And I do have to say, uh, I'm a solar system ambassador volunteer. I'm not employed by NASA or any of its contractors. So any opinions that are expressed during this presentation are mine and mine alone. And they do not represent the views or opinions of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. But just so you know, the uh, ambassador program is a real thing. Uh, it's funded by NASA. It's managed by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, the fine folks who landed the Perseverance rover on Mars last year. Uh, there's over 1,000 ambassadors nationwide. And this is our 25th year as an organization. And since the creation in 1997, uh, the ambassador program has reached more than 10 million people directly and more than half a billion people indirectly. And I think that speaks very, very well of the program. So on May 25th, 1961, three weeks after Alan Shepard became the first American in space, President John F. Kennedy issued the following challenge to Congress and the American people. I'm not going to do an impression, though I used to do a pretty good one. But he did say, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. And within weeks of the president's speech, NASA and the American scientific community began to mobilize in order to achieve this new national goal. Project Apollo was born. Now, each Apollo mission was unique unto itself. There were 12 missions in total, including Apollo 1, and I could spend hours and hours describing each and every one. But because of time constraints, I don't want to keep the library open all night, I will discuss the major mission highlights and provide you with some of the extraordinary photos and videos from these historic voyages. Unfortunately, uh, Apollo got off to a terrible start. I think some of you will remember this. Uh, the Apollo 1 fire on January 27, 1967. Uh, the astronauts were uh, Gus Grissom, Ed White, Roger Chaffee. Gus was the second American in space following uh, Alan Shepard's mission. Ed White was the first American spacewalker. Uh, Roger Chaffee was a rookie astronaut, but he did fly reconnaissance missions during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So he, was, he didn't know what stress was at the time. Uh, at about 6.31 in the evening on that Friday, that terrible Friday night, uh, the astronauts rec reported a fire in the spacecraft. They all died in that unthinkable tragedy, and uh, the nation's resolve was really tested. And here you can see some close-up pictures of what happened. That's the outside of the Apollo 1 command module, scorch marks all over it. This is the inside of the command module. Uh, those are the hoses that the astronauts were hooked up to in their spacesuits. They were cut after the bodies were removed. But if you look over here, that's the flight plan. It survived. 
uh, people are still stunned by that. Everything else in the spacecraft was pretty much consumed. I don't want to go into too much detail about what happened, but I did uh, want you to see what the uh, corrective actions were, were taken. So uh, several major factors were identified which combined to cause the fire and the astronauts' deaths. Uh, the Apollo 1 Review Board recommended the following corrective action, actions be implemented before the next crewed Apollo mission. And they were to adjust the cabin atmosphere to 60% nitrogen and 40% oxygen. Prior to this, it was all 100% oxygen. And it was at 14.7 PSI, which is just about atmospheric pressure. In the, uh, for the fire, everything was just soaked, 100% oxygen, everything. It was virtually a bomb inside the spacecraft. Uh, replace flammable nylon and other uh, materials with non-flammable beta, beta cloth in the spacesuit. A newly designed hatch that could be opened outward within five seconds. The old hatch opened inward. It took 90 seconds to remove. Uh, there was no way the Apollo 1 uh, pilots were going to get out of that thing. They replaced the flammable materials in the cabin with self-extinguishing versions and all plumbing uh, was covered with protective insulation. Uh, aluminum tubing is replaced a sta with stainless whenever possible. So 20 mon 21 months following the Apollo 1 fire, uh, we did get into the sky with the Apollo 7 mission. Uh, the astronauts for that flight were New Jersey's own Wally Shira, uh, Don Isley, command module pilot, Walter Cunningham, lunar module pilot, uh, flew uh, 19, October 1968. And these are some pictures from the mission over here. Uh, the major accomplishments of Apollo 7. It was the first three-person American space flight, the first manned test of the Apollo Command and Service Modules. It was the first Saturn 1B rocket to launch a crew into space from Launch Complex uh, 34. The first live television pictures from manned American spacecraft. The Russians had done it before, but we had not. And the first time hot food was available, uh, which made things a little easier and more palatable uh, for the crew on board. Uh, this is a picture of the launch of Apollo 7 passing, as you can see here, uh, NASA's vehicle assembly building where the Saturn V's were assembled. Here's the crawler transporter, which took the Saturn V out to pad 39. This is a TV downlink. That's Wally Shira. And other pictures of uh, Don Isley and Wally over here holding up the signs, which kept people entertained. That's a really good picture of Wally uh, taken during the mission. Uh, he suffered, the entire crew suffered head colds, and they really got cranky, and there were some uh, disputes with mission control uh, during, the, during the flight, but it was 101% success, though because of the... Uh, arguments they had with the flight controllers. Uh, Wally had already announced his retirement. He wasn't going to fly again. But for Don Isley and Walt Cunningham, they never got another flight assignment. Uh, there's a picture of Wally Shira leaving the spacecraft after splashdown. And a pretty happy crew on the board the recovery at Carrier Essex. Uh, I've never seen Shira so happy. I think he knew his career was over as a, as a space pilot, and uh, he showed. So uh, just two months later uh, was the flight of Apollo 8 with Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders. Uh, first human flight to the moon. Apollo 8's major accomplishments were the first Saturn V to launch a crew into space, the first crewed spacecraft to leave Earth orbit, the first human spacecraft to orbit the moon, uh, the first live TV broadcast while orbiting the moon, including the Christmas Eve reading from the book of Genesis. And the highest speed achieved by humans at that time, uh, 24,696 miles per hour. Uh, this is a picture of Frank Borman leading the crew out to the Astrovan. Uh, that's their launch. And I don't think uh, the birds here enjoyed that very much. 
This is a picture of their translunar injection burn. This was taken over the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is when the third stage of Saturn V was firing. It was taken from an island in the Pacific. Uh, this was the first time humans were about to leave Earth orbit. Uh, we've heard that the uh, first pictures of Earthrise that were seen by human eyes during uh, Apollo 8. This is a picture, a video of, uh, of that Earthrise. And I think uh, for everybody who watched that mission, remembers Apollo 8, this still stands out as probably the highlight of that amazing uh, history-making event. I still get goosebumps listening to that, and I, I heard that live. I'm sure many of you did also that at that Christmas Eve of 1968. Of course, the mission was successful. Uh, spacecraft uh, returned safely, landing in the Pacific Ocean, and three very happy Apollo astronauts returning from the first human flight to the moon. So then we move on from December of 1968 to March of 1969. Uh, with the flight of Apollo 9, uh, Commander uh, Jim McDivitt, Command Module Pilot Dave Scott, Lunar Module Pilot Rusty Schweiker. Uh, sadly, uh, Jim McDivitt passed away last week. So uh, he was one of the Group 2 astronauts, uh, the next nine they were called, and now there are only three survivors from the second American astronaut team. And this mission tested all segments of Apollo hardware in, in Earth orbit. Uh, the major accomplishments, as I said, the first manned flight with all Apollo lunar hardware in Earth orbit, the first crewed flight with the lunar module, uh, and including a rendezvous and docking after six hours and 113 miles separation in space, the first spacewalk of the Apollo program by uh, Rusty Schweiker, and the first mission that was a authorized to use uh, nicknames for spacecraft again. And they were Gumdrop uh, for the command module, Spider for the lunar module. Uh, here's a picture of Dave Scott popping his head out of the command module hatch. Here's Rusty Schweiker doing his EVA on the porch of, uh, of Spider, the steady hand of Jim McDivitt holding the camera. Uh, it's a really good picture taken by Dave Scott of Rusty out on the porch of the lunar module. 
Uh, this is after undocking prior to the separation burn. That's a uh, gumdrop that's being taken by, uh, picture being taken by Dave Scott. And after they did their rendezvous, this is uh, a spider returning to gumdrop. You can see the bottom portion, the, the descent stage of the limb has been jettisoned. This is the ascent portion, the part that would return the astronauts from the surface of the moon. And a nice self-portrait taken inside the spacecraft of all three uh, Apollo 9 astronauts. And they returned safely, and that set the stage for uh, the remainder of the Apollo program, which was going to be all moon missions uh, from here on out. So just two months later, Apollo 10 launched with uh, Commander Tom Stafford, Command Module Pilot John Young, uh, Lunar Module Pilot Gene Cernan. That was in May of 1969. Their spacecraft were named Charlie Brown and Snoopy and all segments of the Apollo lunar hardware were now tested in lunar orbit. Uh, the major accomplishments of Apollo 10 were the first launch of a Saturn V from Pad 39B, uh, the first manned flight with all Apollo hardware uh, in the vicinity of the moon. It was a successful dress rehearsal for the lunar landing and the highest speed ever attained by humans. It's a still standing record of 24,816 miles per hour during re-entry. Uh, this is a picture of the Saturn V launching Apollo 10. And you'll see the staging coming up right over here. First stage dropping away. Second stage engines all firing as it moves up uh, to orbit. Uh, this was taken by the crew on board uh, Snoopy. And here's a picture of Snoopy after it's uh, dropping its descent stage in the rendezvous uh, with Charlie Brown. Uh, uh, Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan are inside here. John Young is taking this picture. And the mission ended successfully in the Pacific Ocean with a splashdown at dawn. And again, three pretty happy Apollo astronauts safely on board the uh, recovery, uh, re recovery carrier. So with the successful conclusion of Apollo 10, NASA had seven months to achieve President Kennedy's goal of landing a man on the moon before the decade was over. An aggressive launch schedule was developed for the remainder of the year. For July, Apollo 11, September, Apollo 12, November, Apollo 13. And uh, if the crews of 11 and 12 were unable to successfully land on the moon, the national goal would not have been achieved because Apollo 13's fate was already sealed. Well, here is the crew of Apollo 11. Neil Armstrong, the commander. Mike Collins, Command Module Pilot, New Jersey's own Buzz Aldrin, Lunar Module Pilot. The major accomplishments, I think everybody knows this, but it was uh, the first human landing on the moon, the first humans to set foot on another world, uh, first mission to set up experiments on the lunar surface and uh, obtain samples uh, rocks and soil for return to Earth, and the first, which is very important, the first successful human launch from the surface of the moon in a safe return to Earth. Uh, there's a picture of Neil leading the crew out to the Astrovan for the trip over to pad 39A. This was the launch of Apollo 11 at 9.32 a.m., uh, July 16th, 1969. This is the lunar landing. Uh, no sound on this, but you can see the eagle uh, coming down for its landing. You'll see the uh, shadow of the foot pad coming down with the landing probe right there, indicating contact and landing. And then uh, 
at 10.56 p.m. on July 20th, 1969, human history was made. Um, uh, at the foot of the ladder, the limb footbeds are only uh, uh, exactly the same as about uh, one or two inches, uh, although the surface appears to be uh, very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder down there. I think we all remember that. This is a picture taken by the automatic camera on the right side of the LEM window. And if you look carefully, Neil just took his first steps on the moon. But his visor is up. You can actually see his face. Uh, the astronauts who always had this ND1 neutral density filter so they wouldn't get blinded by the sun. But Neil wanted to see what the surface really looked like when you had the, the sunglasses on, threw off the, the color a little bit. So he raised his visor, not looking directly into the sun, you know, God forbid. But uh, that, that's a, a really cool picture uh, of Neil. And here the crew are setting up the American flag. And once again, if you look at this as it repeats, Neil Armstrong has the, uh, the camera. He was the only one with the camera right there. Buzz Aldrin did not have it. But as Buzz walks over to the flag, you can see he also lowers his visor. He also had it up. And that's a picture of a man who was very happy with his job. Yeah. Uh, that was following the moonwalk. You can see how tired his eyes look. Uh, but uh, Neil Armstrong did a fabulous job, and I couldn't think of a better person to have been the first human on the moon. Uh, this was their launch from the moon, and I say woo because everybody held their breath that day on July 21st of that uh, ascent engine would actually burn on the lunar module. Uh, Buzz Aldrin was a little late turning the camera on, so you're going to hear some ear to ground uh, before you actually see the pictures. That was the voice of John McLeish from uh, Mission Control, Houston. There you go. Uh, Eagle, of course, made it into orbit safely. This is a picture of uh, Eagle rendezvousing with Columbia. Mike Collins waiting patiently for his uh, friends to come back from the lunar surface. Uh, this is their splashdown on July 24th, splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. And President Nixon greeting the crew on board the Hornet. Uh, 
I think everybody looks pretty happy in this shot. It was, uh, I remember that day as if it was yesterday. It was, it was just remarkable that we managed to pull this off. And uh, I think I was smiling just as much as the, uh, the folks in this picture were. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of talk whether the lunar landings actually took place. There are some doubters out there, uh, conspiracy theorists. I believe it did. Now, we have a spacecraft orbiting the moon for several years now called Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it took these pictures of the Apollo 11 landing site. And you can clearly see the descent stage still on the surface there. Uh, where they put two of the experiment packages, the laser ranging retroreflector and the passive seismic experiment were right there. And if you look closely, if you see right here that little line, those are Neil Armstrong's footprints as he walked over to explore Little West Crater. But I think any picture could be doctored, anything could be faked, but I think this gives pretty good evidence that this thing really happened. And this is something that I, uh, I've always thought about. When President Kennedy uh, said we were going to land on the moon, his words, uh, the nation committing itself to the goal before the decade is out of landing a man on the moon. When Neil gave his transmission, when he first stepped foot on the moon, it came out as that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But he insisted that he said, Amen. And he kept doing that for years and years after the event itself. I've never heard this from anyone, never read about it. It's my own personal thought. But I think Neil was trying to honor President Kennedy by saying, Amen. And it just didn't come out in this transmission. Uh, they've gone over and over the audio. And that A just has never been heard. But I think that was Neil Armstrong's intention. So uh, the great success of Apollo 11 uh, was followed by one of the most overlooked and underappreciated space missions of all time, which was Apollo 12. Uh, it was supposed to take off originally in September of 1969. The successful lunar landing by Apollo 11 bumped it back a couple of months. So they flew in uh, November of 1969. Uh, Commander Pete Conrad, uh, Command Module Pilot Dick Gordon, Lunar Module Pilot Alan Bean. Their spacecraft were named Yankee Clipper and Intrepid, and their landing site was the Ocean of Storms. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but Apollo 12 was hit twice by lightning during launch. But they survived. And then he went on to uh, perform the first pinpoint landing on the moon. Uh, Conrad and Dean performed two moonwalks. They set up a nuclear powered experiment package called ALSEP. Uh, second moonwalk, they retrieved parts of the Surveyor 3 probe that landed on the moon two and a half years prior. Now, it was a gray, rainy day uh, when Apollo 12 launched. And you can see the uh, the clouds overhead, but there was no lightning in the area. That would have been a constraint to launch. The rain itself uh, did not. Plus the fact President Nixon was here that day, and I don't think they wanted to disappoint him. But during launch, uh, Apollo 12 became the world's largest lightning rod, and it was struck twice by lightning. And here you can see one of the bolts hitting the vehicle. In fact, both of those lightning bolts uh, followed the Saturn V's exhaust plume right down to the ground, twice hitting pad 39A. You can clearly see the impacts over there. But amazingly, the, the spacecraft survived with no damage. Yeah. And these are some nice pictures that were taken uh, by Apollo 12 by the crew. I, I especially like this one of Pete Conrad backing out of the limb, uh, out of uh, going down the ladder, you can actually see the surface of the moon kind of falling away, so you kind of know you're on a, uh, 
on, on a round object, the moon being smaller than the Earth, but it's, uh, you, can, you can really tell that you're on a globe. And there's the setup of the American flag, Alan Bean coming down, uh, now becoming the fourth man on the moon. Pete was the third. Uh, this is uh, removing the, uh, the nuclear power source for the ALSEP package. And this is what the package looked like once it was deployed on the surface. And that's a picture of Pete Conrad taking a, a piece of Surveyor 3, taking off, that's the TV camera over there. Remove that to bring it back to Earth. And there you can see uh, Intrepid, the American flag right there and the high gain antenna that was set up. And this is Alan Bean scooting across the surface. Again, the uh, Intrepid is right back here. And the crew returned successfully, mission was accomplished, and here they are inside of their uh, quarantine facility. And again, the uh, LRO pictures of their landing site. Uh, there you can see the descent stage of Intrepid, uh, the deployment of the ALSEP package here, their footprints all over the place. This is their trip down to Surveyor 3, which is over here. And uh, 1969 mission was accomplished. Not just once, but twice, we landed humans on the moon. I think President Kennedy would have been very proud of that. So any questions on Apollo missions one through 12? And I can't see if you raise a hand, so just speak up. What happened with Apollo two, three, and four? Ah, good question. Uh, NASA had this really absurd way of numbering the early Apollo flights. Apollo one was actually named Apollo 204. It was based upon the launch vehicle, which was the second generation Saturn called the Saturn 1B, and the 04 would have been the flight sequence. So the first actual Apollo Saturn mission was Apollo 201, and that was followed by 202 and 203. Apollo 1, the official designation and also the official inquiry uh, review board it's called the Apollo 204 Review Board, not Apollo 1. But I just wanted to keep things a little more simple for you. Gus Grissom did name the ship, did name the mission Apollo 1. And as a tribute to the crew following the fire, NASA gave them, let them have the name Apollo 1. Apollo 2, uh, two and 3 were uh, given to missions that did not fly. They were planned but did not fly. And then they started again with Apollo 4, which was the first unmanned flight of the Saturn V. I know that's a little convoluted, but that was the reason uh, there's that gap between Apollo 1, Apollo 4, Apollo 7. Any other questions? I, I can't see if you raise a hand, so just speak up. Okay. So we're going to move on to 1970. And the new decade begins with a really perilous voyage. Flight of Apollo 13, commanded by Jim Lovell. I had the honor of meeting a few years ago. Uh, command module pilot Jack Swiger, lunar module pilot Fred Hayes. Jack Swiger replaced Ken Mattingly on the crew just two days before launch when Mattingly, it was revealed, was exposed to measles, German measles. He had no immunity to it. The other astronauts did. Uh, they flew in April of 1970. Their spacecraft were named Odyssey and Aquarius. And I think we know some of the stories about it. Uh, but the crew survived two nearly catastrophic accidents, not just one. Uh, because it didn't enter lunar orbit, Apollo 13 is set the still standing record for the far farthest human distance from Earth, 249 and 200, 205 miles. Uh, the accident drove NASA to improve the safety of the Apollo command and service modules for all future missions, for the Apollo lunar missions, 
the Skylab missions and the Apollo-Soyuz test project. And despite all that happened with Apollo 13, the program was delayed only three months. So NASA corrected the, uh, the, the, accident, uh, the cause of the accident quite, quite quickly. Uh, as I said, there were two possible uh, catastrophic failures. The first one occurred during launch. Uh, the Saturn V second stage, called the S2, uh, the center engine, engine number five right there, uh, suffered an early shutdown due to an effect called POGO, POGO oscillation. I can't explain it in its entirety, but basically a sloshing of fuel uh, during flight uh, causing uh, an uneven flow of fuel through the line. Uh, it would, engine five was just a few seconds away from, from exploding. The entire vehicle would have exploded. At that point, uh, Apollo 13 would have been in what they call the mode two uh, abort phase where Jim Lovell would have to s physically by himself separate uh, the Apollo spacecraft from the booster just prior to explosion. And not only would the explosion have taken out the second stage itself, it would have taken out the third stage also. Both powered by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, it would have been a mess. But that was a little overlooked because at the 56 hour mark of the flight, at a distance of about 200,000 miles from Earth. Uh, in the service module, oxygen tank number two suffered an explosion that also damaged tank number one, curtailing all electrical power to the command module Odyssey. And the explosion blew the cover off of the service module bay number four, right over here. So uh, with the uh, service module basically dead, command module only had batteries left, uh, the lunar module Aquarius was used as a lifeboat, allowing the Apollo 13 crew to survive the journey back to Earth. And this picture shows Odyssey in Aquarius after separating from the now dead service module just prior to re-entry. So there is uh, Odyssey, and there is Aquarius, and there's the dead uh, service module. And from this actual picture, uh, Jim Lovell just screamed out over the line, uh, the comm line, there's a whole side of that spacecraft missing. And here you can see where the panel was blown out. It really was a mess. The crew did survive because uh, the lunar module Aquarius uh, had enough life support equipment to get all three astronauts back uh, safely and mission control radioed uh, the final words. It's farewell, Aquarius, and we thank you. Crew survived their entry, splashing down into the Pacific Ocean. Here are three very, very happy astronauts on their return to, to Earth. And here's an interesting little nugget I think you'll find uh, about Apollo 13. This is actually something that was set up for the uh, 40th anniversary of the Apollo 13 mission. I started using it when the 50th anniversary came about, but I think you'll find this interesting. And it runs about three minutes, but uh, it's, uh, it's quite intriguing. You don't have to be a space freak to know the story of Apollo 13. Chances are you saw Ron Howard's 1995 film, which told the story to the world. You know that astronaut Jim Lovell and his crew had to abort their trip to the moon when an oxygen tank exploded 200,000 miles from Earth. You may remember the men had to use their lunar lander's rocket engine to get back onto the proper course for Earth. And you know what would have happened if the astronauts had failed. They would have missed the Earth and died a lonely death in space when their oxygen ran out. Even more chilling, their bodies would never have returned because Apollo 13 would have circled in space forever. Or so I always thought. It's the story in just about every published account of Apollo 13, including my own book, A Man on the Moon. And it's what I still believed in early 2000 when I asked analytical graphics to create some simulations of key moments from the flight. A few weeks later, 
I got a call from Bob Hall, one of the technical experts there, telling me that something strange had come up. Hall and his team had been working on a simulation showing what would have happened if the astronauts had failed to get back on course. In the simulation, Apollo 13 misses the Earth as expected. But instead of missing it by 40,000 miles, the number that's in all the books, the spacecraft comes much closer, only about 2,500 miles. Then it follows a new orbit that stretches 350,000 miles out into space before it falls back toward Earth again. At first, it looks as if the old story is still correct. But then comes the really big surprise. In the simulation, the spacecraft passes about 30,000 miles from the moon, close enough for the moon's gravity to change its orbit. Now, when Apollo 13 heads back toward Earth, it's on a collision course. On May 20th, 1970, five weeks after the explosion, Apollo 13 plunges into the atmosphere and burns up. I was just as startled to hear this as Bob Hall was. We both wanted some kind of confirmation. So I put him in touch with Chuck Dietrich, a flight controller who helped get the Apollo 13 astronauts home. Dietrich went digging into his own files from 30 years earlier, and he found data that confirmed the simulation was right. Of course, Jim Lovell and his crew did get back home safely. And Apollo 13 is a reminder to all of us what people can accomplish when they work together and refuse to fail. I still think it's a story that will be as exciting 100 years from now as it is today. And now it's even more interesting than it was before. I'm Andrew Chaikin, author of A Man on the Moon. Pretty interesting. Yeah. Had no idea. And if you uh, want to read a really good book on the Apollo project, I highly recommend A Man on the Moon by Andrew Chaikin. It's excellent, just excellent. Uh, as I said, the Apollo program was only delayed three months following the Apollo 13 accident. Uh, Apollo 14 was supposed to fly in October of 1970. Instead, it took off at the end of January. Not a long delay. Uh, commander of the mission was Alan Shepard, the first American in space. Uh, command module pilot was Stu Rusa. Lunar module pilot, Ed Mitchell. Their spacecraft were named Kitty Hawk and Antares. Uh, the joke was that because Alan Shepard at the time was 47 years old, he was the oldest uh, astronaut to have flown at that time, that he named Kitty Hawk after his first flight. You got it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, their landing site was uh, the Frau Morrow Highlands, which was the original Apollo 13 uh, landing site. The major accomplishments of Apollo 14, uh, they carried out the crew, the longest list of experiments on the lunar surface and lunar orbit as of that time. Uh, during the course of two moonwalks, Shepard and Mitchell demonstrated they could travel relatively long distances on foot, uh, Al Shepard hit two golf balls while on the lunar surface. They returned almost 100 pounds of lunar samples to Earth, including a 20-pound rock which contained something called the felsite class, which is perhaps the oldest intact earth rock ever discovered. I'll repeat that. Earth rock discovered on the moon. I'll get into more detail on that a little later. Here's a picture of Al Shepard holding the flag. And you can tell with this mission, uh, though it was Apollo 13 that actually started, it is the first time you got to actually see uh, the commander wearing red stripes. During Apollo 12, there was confusion uh, between pictures of, Al, of uh, Pete Conrad and Alan Dean. They really couldn't tell who was who in some of the shots. So they gave the commander, uh, starting with Apollo 13, uh, red stripes to make sure they could tell who was who on the lunar surface. And there is a picture, uh, an animation, I mean a video, of the crew setting up the flag there. Uh, that's Ed Mitchell, a picture taken by uh, Alan Shepard. 
just to look out there at the, day, at the uh, Frau Mauro Highlands. Uh, not really sure which astronaut that is, but you can definitely see uh, the Antares lunar module over here, uh, the planes here at Frau Mauro. Here's Al hitting uh, the golf ball right there. And for the most part, that was what Apollo 14 was known for, Al Shepard hitting those, uh, those golf shots. Uh, pictures from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter showing the, uh, the descent stage, the ALSEP package where they set the experiments, and their path up Cone Crater where they discovered the felt site class. This is where they went up. This is the way they came back. Again, you can clearly see the footprints on the surface there. But as I mentioned before, uh, there was a rock called Big Bertha, 20-pounder, and it contained the felsite clast, which is seen right over here, that little sliver. And again, the clast is arguably the oldest intact earth rock ever discovered. Now, there is a story to it. This is a very busy slide, but I think you'll find it of interest that about 4.0, 4.1 billion years ago, there was a magma chamber created 12 miles under Earth's crust, and that hardened into the felsite class. Now, repeated asteroid and meteorite impacts during that time drove the class closer and closer to the Earth's surface until about 4 billion years ago, another projectile hit the planet with enough force to launch the class into space. Now, the moon was three times closer to the Earth at that time, so it was able to enter the moon's gravity well fairly quickly and reached the surface. And then about 3.9 billion years ago, another impact on the moon partially melted the clast, drove it under the lunar surface, where it merged with other clasts to become part of a rock known as a Brescia. And that rock was eventually named Big Bertha. And finally, some 26 million years ago, another asteroid strike set Big Bertha free propelled it to the surface on the spot on Cone Crater, where on February 6, 1971, two explorers from the planet Earth, Alan Shepard and Ed Mitchell, collected the rock, allowing the felsite class to begin its long journey back home. Now, sadly, the entire crew of Apollo 14 had passed away before the true story of Big Bertha and the felsite class was announced to the public in January of 2019. Uh, Shepard, Rusa, and Mitchell were totally unaware as to the historical nature of their find. Uh, here they are, uh, Alan Shepard and Ed Mitchell over here looking at Big Bertha, not knowing that they had found the oldest earth rock ever. Uh, we move on to Apollo 15, which was my favorite Apollo mission. It had everything. Mission was commanded by uh, Dave Scott. Uh, Al Worden was command module pilot. Jim Irwin was lunar module pilot. They flew July through August 1971. Their spacecraft were known as Endeavour and Falcon. Landing site was the Hadley Apennine area. The major accomplishments of Apollo 15, uh, three moonwalks. They are on the surface for 67 hours. Uh, 18 and a half hours on the lunar surface. They used the first lunar roving vehicle, basically a car, uh, to ex explore the Hadley Apennine region. And they drove a total of about 17.3 miles. They collected 170 pounds of surface material. And Al Worden performed the first deep space EVA, the first deep space spacewalk at a distance of almost 200,000 miles from Earth. Uh, this is a picture of Dave Scott, a little video showing him driving LRV-1, Lunar Roving Vehicle 1, on the surface, kicking up a lot of dust. Uh, this is a panoramic view of the landing site. You can see the Hadley Rill over here, a uh, lunar module way back there, and there's Mount Hadley where they had to come over and land. And there's the LRV over here. Again, I can't tell which astronaut that is by the, uh, by the rover. 
Another picture of the Hadley Apennine area. There's a there's Falcon, the LRZ over there. Uh, during the mission, Dave Scott performed an experiment that you cannot do on Earth. But a couple hundred years ago, the great Galileo Galilei <laughs> said that if you dropped two objects of different mass or different weight uh, from the same height in a vacuum, they would fall at the same, the same rate. Uh, you can't do that on Earth because we're in an atmosphere. <clears throat> but Dave took a hammer and a falcon feather, you see over here, dropped them on the moon, and they both hit the surface at the same time. So, uh, so Galileo proposed this uh, experiment back in the 1600s, and in 1971, Dave Scott proved him to be right. Uh, also, this was the first time that a launch from the moon was televised back to Earth. And there you see the departure of Falcon as it takes off from the lunar surface. Uh, there is uh, Al Worden conducting the first deep space EVA, returning the uh, uh, film canisters from the Sim Bay, the Scientific Instrument Module Bay. Uh, when 15 came back, one of its parachutes had collapsed. You can see over there. So it hit the water a little bit faster than the other Apollo missions had, but everything was fine. Uh, the spacecraft can take a little extra impact. And there's the crew upon their, uh, their arrival on the recovery, uh, recovery carrier. And these are the LRO pictures of the landing site. Uh, you can see the lunar module. This is where uh, the descent stage of Falcon is. Uh, the uh, scientific instrument packages were over here. The rover was parked over here. And you can clearly see the uh, rover tracks, the footprints uh, in this area. There's another, you can almost see that trail there from the rover. Uh, I think there's pretty good evidence that we had a, a human presence on the moon there at Hadley Apennine. And then uh, in April of 1972, Apollo 16 took to the skies. Uh, the commander was John Young. Ken Mattingly was the command module pilot. He was originally on Apollo 13. He was the one who was exposed to German measles and was transitioned uh, to Apollo 16. And uh, Charlie Duke was lunar module pilot. Their spacecraft were named Casper and Orion. Their landing site was the Descartes Highlands. Uh, the major accomplishments, major highlights for Apollo 16 uh, were uh, John Young and Charlie Duke performed three moonwalks. They were on the moon for 71 hours, and they spent more than 20 hours on the lunar surface. Uh, LRV-2 was used to help explore Descartes, and they drove a total of 17 miles during their uh, explorations. They collected over 200 pounds of lunar surface material. Ken Mattingly performed a second deep space EVA at a distance of, again, uh, 200,000 miles. And the one thing Apollo 16 did, it disproved the theory at the time that the lunar highlands were created by volcanic processes. Descartes was clearly created by an asteroid strike. <coughs> and the fact that uh, <coughs> uh, Young and Duke were only finding these impact rocks, which are called breches, as that uh, Big Bertha was on Apollo 14, the geologists in mission control were actually angry at the crew for finding breches instead of volcanic rocks. I, I could not believe that when I heard it. They found what was there, and the scientists were proven wrong, and they refused to accept that at the time. Just, just not right. Uh, this is a view out of the uh, lunar module window out of uh, Orion's window showing the, uh, the site at Descartes. Uh, there's Young and Duke setting up the flag. That's John, John Young taking the LRV out for what they call the Grand Prix, a high-speed ride just to check out the systems on the, uh, on the rover. All that dust come flying up from the surface. Uh, 
Uh, they did have some trouble with their footing. Uh, they did take a couple of headers uh, during Apollo 16. This is one of my favorite pictures of all time on the surface. This is a remastered shot uh, of John Young. Of course, you can tell he's the commander with the, the red stripes. But you can look at the detail on this. Uh, you can actually see the true color of the lunar surface here, how clear uh, John's picture is, the instrumentation that was left of the ALSEP package. This is the, uh, the nuclear-powered scientific package. It's just an amazing, amazing shot. The, the clarity of it, uh, you can see the footprints over here, the other rocks in the distance. It's just an amazing picture. Uh, this is their launch from the moon. And there's the uh, scientific package as they passed over it. And that's the shadow of Orion as it was lifting off. Uh, they did suffer some damage during that lunar liftoff. Right back here, you can see a whole bunch of warped uh, metal. Didn't seem to affect the spacecraft or the crew, but they did suffer some, uh, some damage that had not been seen before. And this is uh, uh, Ken Mattingly performing his deep space EVA, retrieving those uh, film cassettes. And you can see he's wearing John Young's helmet. <laughs> with the red stripes over here. And he's being assisted by, uh, by Charlie Duke. John was in control of the spacecraft at the time. And there they are, at the landing in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, I think that's a really nice shot of the, the three crew members. John Young, Ken Mattingly, and Charlie Duke over there. And these are the pictures from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter showing uh, Orion's the sense stage, uh, the, the final resting place of lunar uh, roving vehicle, the, f the tire tracks, the footprints, uh, where the experiment packages were left. Some more rover tracks right over here. You can see them. Pretty convincing evidence. And then we move on to the final mission of the Apollo program, Apollo 17 which is uh, going to celebrate its 50th anniversary in just a couple of months, uh, December of 1972. The spacecraft were named American Challenger. The crew was Commander Gene Cernan, uh, Command Module Pilot Ron Evans, and Lunar Module Pilot Jack Schmidt. And their landing site was the Taurus Litro Valley. Uh, the major accomplishments <coughs> of Apollo 17 uh, three moonwalks by uh, Cernan and Schmidt, 75 hours on the surface, 22 hours absolutely outside on their EVAs, uh, Lunar Roving Vehicle 3, LRV-3, uh, helped to explore the valley. The, the crew traveled a distance of 22 miles, and at one point they were nearly five miles from the landing site, which is the record. Uh, they collected 250 pounds of surface material including some volcanic glass beads that were created uh, three and a half billion years ago. Juan Evans performed another deep space EVA, and Gene Cernan was the last human to leave footprints on the moon. Uh, that's their launch. It was a nighttime launch. It was the first nighttime launch of the Saturn V. Totally lit up the sky. That's a nice picture of Gene Cernan on the surface of the moon with the American flag. Earth in the background. This is Gene uh, driving the LRV by himself, being filmed uh, by uh, Jack Schmidt. Another picture of Cernan by the lunar roving vehicle. Uh, I believe that's Jack Schmidt. He's a professional geologist, a PhD exploring one of the big boulders that were there in the Taurus Valley. Uh, there's uh, LRV-3. And you remember that picture of Neil Armstrong after his moonwalk with the big smile on his face? Uh, this is Gene Cernan after his third moonwalk. And they say being an astronaut is a glamorous uh, career. 
Gene doesn't look like he's in a really glamorous place right now. He looks really grubby and tired, and I'm sure he really needed a bath. Uh, they did discover orange soil on the moon during their second moonwalk uh, by an area called Shorty Crater. They discovered that little patch of orange soil, and it turned out those were small beads of volcanic glass that formed in a lunar fire fountain about three and a half billion years ago. This is a uh, video of a fire fountain on Earth. So this is what was, this is what created that. And this was the last launch from the moon, human launch from the moon, as Challenger rises up to meet the uh, command module America in lunar orbit. That's Ron Evans during his uh, deep space EVA. And the crew returned successfully, safely. And the Apollo program was essentially over. Uh, these were the uh, pictures by the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter of the Taurus Littrow landing site. There's the Challenger descent stage, uh, the final resting place of the lunar roving vehicle, their footprints, tire tracks, uh, the outset package deployed over here, the American flag over here. So uh, we do a retrospective now uh, with the splashdown of Apollo 17 on December 19th, 1972, uh, the lunar landing program was officially over. From October 1968 through December of 1972, there were 11 crewed Apollo missions that were flown. We're not counting uh, Apollo 1 here. Apollo 7 and Apollo 9 were Earth orbital missions. Apollo 8 was the first piloted spacecraft to, order another, to orbit another celestial body. And uh, the final mission, Apollo 17, marked the sixth moon landing and the ninth crewed mission beyond low Earth orbit. 29 astronauts flew on Project Apollo. Four flew twice. Uh, Jim Lovell, Dave Scott, John Young, and Gene Cernan. And three of them flew to the moon twice, Lovell, Young, and Cernan. The program returned over 800 pounds of lunar rocks and soil to the Earth which greatly contributed to the understanding of the moon's composition and geological history, and those samples are still being studied today. So the legacy of Apollo is uh, six flags on the moon. Apollo 11, Apollo 12, of course 13 did not make it, 14, 15, 16, and 17. These are the 12 American astronauts who worked, walked on the moon. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Pete Conrad, Alan Bean, Alan Shepard, Edgar Mitchell, Dave Scott, Jim Irwin, John Young, Charlie Duke, Gene Cernan, Jack Schmidt. Out of those 12, only four are still with us. New Jersey's own Buzz Aldrin, Dave Scott, Charlie Duke, and Jack Schmidt. So uh, any questions on Apollo missions 13 through 17? I have a question about all those uh, scientific um, instruments that they kept leaving on the surface. Mm -hmm. Were these transmitting things back to the Earth? Oh, yes. And except for Apollo 11, all the others, starting with Apollo 12, were nuclear powered. And they lasted for years and years and years. The next question is, um, you keep mentioning that they kept changing the fuel canisters. What was that all about? On the uh, command module, I'm sorry, the service module of missions uh, 15, 16, and 17, they had these special cameras that were on board uh, called an area called the SIM bay, the Scientific Instrument Module Bay uh, of the spacecraft. Uh, those film canisters studied the moon while the command module pilot was there by himself orbiting the moon, uh, taking different kind of pictures, different kind of measurements. But those film canisters had to be physically removed from the SIM bay 
into the command module. So the command module pilot on those three missions uh, were, was assigned to take the deep space walk to retrieve those canisters, bring them inside the command module for return to Earth. Any other questions? So uh, after Apollo ended, uh, interest in the moon kind of waned for a while. And it would be more than 20 years until American scientific probes returned. But what they discovered re-energized interest in, uh, in the moon, our nearest celestial neighbor. And some of those uh, unmanned probes included uh, the Clementine mission, the Lunar Prospector mission, and still active Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Those pictures I showed you of those various landing sites were taken by LRO over here. And then in uh, January of 2004, President uh, George W. Bush announced his uh, vision for space exploration called the VSE. And it was conceived as a response to the Space Shuttle Columbia accident, uh, the state of NASA, human spaceflight at NASA at the time, and, and a way to regain public enthusiasm for space exploration, which had been waning. Uh, so the, uh, the goals of the VSE were completion of the International Space Station by 2010, a retirement of the space shuttle following the completion of the space station, develop a new spacecraft, uh, the Crew Exploration Vehicle, which is now called Orion. Uh, they wanted that done by 2008 and conduct the first <coughs> human flight by 2014. Uh, they were going to explore the moon with robotic spacecraft by 2008 and crewed missions by 2020. Uh, then on to Mars, and then to also pursue commercial transportation to support the ISS uh, in missions beyond low Earth orbit. And the torch was now passed from Apollo to the Constellation program. Everybody remembers Constellation? Mm. Yes, no? Yeah. <laughs> One person. <laughs> okay. This was really an interesting program. I'm sorry it didn't come to fruition. Uh, the Constellation program hardware were uh, four components, four main components. The Ares-1 crew launch vehicle, which is basically a modified space shuttle uh, solid rocket booster with an added extra segment to it and a J2 engine, J2X engine upper stage. This would have been the Orion spacecraft here with the escape tower. Uh, the Ares 5 heavy lift launch vehicle, uh, two larger solid rocket boosters and hydrogen powered first and second stages. The Orion crew exploration vehicle, as I mentioned before and uh, the lunar lander, human lunar landing system, uh, called Altair. It was a very elegant system. Uh, since the inception of uh, the Constellation in 2004, only one test flight was conducted. Uh, October 28th, 2009, so tomorrow would be 13 years uh, since Ares 1X. I remember watching it, thinking, boy, this thing's really going to go. And it, that was it <laughs> for, for the uh, Constellation flight. So what happened? Well, following the President's announcement, uh, NASA estimated the original cost of Constellation would be in excess of $230 billion. <laughs> and that was in 2004 dollars. Uh, but unsolved technical design challenges made it impossible for NASA to give a conclusive estimate. So upon taking office in 2009, President Obama declared Constellation to be over budget, behind schedule, and lacking in innovation. And after a series of reviews, uh, the President decided to uh, exclude Constellation for the 2011 federal budget, and the program was canceled. So there would be no passing of the torch of the Apollo torch uh, to a constellation generation. Now, uh, in 2010, President Obama did announce uh, his administration's new policy, space policy. Uh, he committed increasing NASA's budget by $6 billion over five years, continuing construction of the Orion vehicle, and designing a new heavy lift vehicle. And that became the Space Launch System, SLS. Uh, he also proposed a manned Orion flight to a near-Earth object asteroid by 2025 
followed by U.S. crewed uh, missions to Mars uh, by the mid-2030s. The NEO mission was later changed to the Asteroid Redirect Mission. Uh, President Obama strongly supported a partnership with private industry, which at first NASA was reluctant to pursue, but uh, has turned out to be quite rewarding, especially their uh, partnership with SpaceX. Uh, in response to potential job losses at the Cape, uh, the President promised a $40 million effort to help Florida's Space Coast workers affected by the cancellation of Constellation and the end of the Space Shuttle program. Uh, but despite the words of support uh, from the Obama administration, uh, NASA's human space exploration plans continued to flounder. Uh, the only flight in the entire history of the uh, program of the Orion spacecraft so far to date was Exploration Flight Test 1 in December of 2014. Uh, if my math is correct, that was eight years ago. And then the launch vehicle was the Delta IV Heavy. It wasn't even one of the original vehicles to launch Orion. So uh, the asteroid redirect mission I found interesting at first because the original concept was to send a crewed Orion spacecraft to a near-Earth object, an asteroid, and spend several weeks studying it and returning samples to the Earth. And this would have been the first human mission to surpass the million mile mark. And that would have been a truly historic event. I was really looking forward to that. Uh, but in 2014, NASA decided to replace the crewed mission, the piloted mission, with a robotic vehicle that would capture an asteroid and redirect it into a distant retrograde lunar orbit. It put it in orbit around the moon, where a crewed, via, a crewed Orion spacecraft would then rendezvous with the, uh, the asteroid, inspect it, study it, sample it, and determine its composition, internal structure, and assess its potential for resource utilization. I found that to be absolutely ridiculous. It, I, NASA was not comfortable with sending a crew out, apparently, that, that far, but that's what Orion was built for. <laughs> they never took advantage of the, uh, of the potential of that spacecraft. We still haven't. So uh, what happened to the asteroid redirect mission? With the election of President Trump in 2016, the space policy of the United States pivoted once again. Uh, the Trump administration in 2018 canceled the asteroid redirect mission along with four science missions and the agency's Office of Education. Then on December 11th, 2017, the president issued the Space Policy Directive 1. And this directive stated that the United States would then lead an innovative and sustainable program of exploration with commercial and international partners that would enable human expansion across the solar system and bring back to Earth new knowledge and new opportunities. And beginning with missions beyond low Earth orbit, the U.S. would lead the return of humans to the moon for long-term exploration and utilization, followed by human missions to Mars and other destinations. So even in today's divided political climate, Space Policy Directive 1 continues to receive strong bipartisan congressional support. It might be the only thing keeping the country united right now. And the next American lunar landing mission is now targeted for the mid-2020s. We're just a few years away. So it appears that the Apollo torch has finally, finally been passed on to a new generation. First step on the moon, Neil Armstrong, July 20th, 1969. Last step, almost 50 years ago, Gene Cernan, December 14th, 1972. Next step, Project Artemis. In Greek mythology, Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo, and she was the goddess of the moon. And now she personifies NASA's program to return astronauts to the lunar surface, including the first woman and the first person of color. And when they land, our astronauts will set foot where no human has ever been before, the moon's south pole. 
The Artemis hardware includes the Space Launch System rocket, the Orion Crew Exploration Vehicle, the Lunar Orbital Gateway, a small space station that we put in a distant uh, halo orbit around the moon, Uh, the segments of Gateway will be launched by the SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket. The human landing system, the SpaceX Starship, which is on the pad right now in, in Texas. Yeah. And this is what it looks like. It'll be launched with the SpaceX Super Heavy booster. It will launch Starship for the landing system and lunar fuel depots that will be parked at the Gateway. Uh, this is a lot of stuff here, but this is basically the Artemis 1 mission. Uh, we'll break it down a little simpler for you here. Artemis 1 will restore America's ability to reach the moon with systems built for humans. Launching east from Kennedy Space Center, the Space Launch System will propel an uncrewed Orion spacecraft to orbit and then commit to a lunar trajectory with a trans-lunar injection. This outbound coast will intersect with the moon to enter a distant retrograde orbit. With systems checked, the engine will once again fire to exit lunar orbit and set Orion on a path back to Earth. Fairly simple. This is the Artemis 1 update as of today. The next launch window opens November 14th, just after midnight, and that launch window closes December 9th. Uh, November 4th, NASA hopes to roll uh, the stack out to pad 39A, and hopefully we'll be able to launch the Artemis 1 mission uh, during this upcoming launch window. We're only four or five years behind schedule, so you know, what the heck. What determines the launch window? Uh, the alignment between Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, the different angles, uh, how much fuel could be used. As of now, I'm going to go back to the Orion. I know this is a real busy slide, but basically Artemis 1, if it had launched during the summer, as we had wanted it to, uh, the original launch date was in August, then moved to September, it would have been a 46-day mission, unmanned. The new target with the November launch window, last I heard, the, the length of mission will be only 23 days. And again, it has to do with the distance of the moon, the earth, and the, and the angle of the sun all at the same time. So basically, if Artemis 1 takes off in a few, uh, in a few weeks, uh, it will be half the, the, the length of time as it had, if it had launched during the summer. Uh, this is a schematic of Artemis II, which will be the first human flight of the uh, Orion spacecraft. Basically, this will be a 10-day mission, four astronauts uh, in lunar orbit. This will be the Artemis equivalent of Apollo 8. And then Artemis III is supposed to be the next lunar landing, uh, probably in about 2025. We hope it'll be... Uh, a four-person crew out to the moon with two astronauts landing on the moon. And they'll spend about a week on the surface before returning. Uh, this is what it would look like in the future with the Orion spacecraft over here and the human landing system Starship over here at the Lunar Orbital Gateway, this little space station. Uh, this is a little video of what it will look like when uh, Starship lands on the moon. Pretty cute.
And once the astronauts land on the moon at the South Pole, and there are 13 different candidate landing sites down there, uh, they will set up what they call Artemis Base Camp. And then once they leave the moon, return to Earth, Orion will re-enter Earth's atmosphere. Parachute landing in the Pacific Ocean, and landing in recovery by the U.S. Navy. At the conclusion of the Apollo 13 motion picture, which I believe most of you probably have seen, yeah. uh, Jim Lovell, portrayed by Tom Hanks, speaks these words. And again, uh, if you saw the movie at the end, there, that's the real Jim Lovell over here, who's pl playing the captain of the recovery uh, carrier. This is Tom Hanks here. Tom Hanks said, I look up at the moon and wonder, when will we, we be going back and who will that be? Last December, NASA announced that a subset of 18 astronauts were selected for crew assignments on early Artemis missions. Uh, however, just a couple of months ago, uh, NASA's chief astronaut, Reed Weissman, announced that all 42 current NASA astronauts, as well as the 10 trainees, uh, would be considered for flight assignments on Artemis II and beyond. Now, pending a successful test flight of Artemis I, fingers crossed, NASA hopes to name the Artemis II crew before the end of this year. That could shift. The mission is expected to launch no earlier than 2024. But we won't be going alone this time. Unlike Apollo, uh, the U.S. government and NASA are spearheading what they call the Artemis Accords. And the Artemis Accords are a bilateral agreement between the United States government and other international governments that participate in the, in the Artemis program. They describe a shared vision of principles to create a safe and transparent environment in which to pursue space exploration, science, and commercial activities for the benefit of all humanities. Presently, 21 nations have signed the Artemis Accords. China and Russia are not signatories. Uh, they decided to pursue space exploration on their own terms, but maybe one day we can all get together on this. Yeah. Don't hold your breath. Yeah. And uh, that concludes my talk on Artemis. Are there any questions on the Artemis project? What are these heavy rockets that you mentioned? Uh, there was a Delta IV heavy, there was the Falcon heavy. Uh, and the SpaceX heavy booster. Those are a larger, how am I gonna put this? There are these basic vehicles, the Delta launch vehicle. Uh, they combine three cores of the Delta IV to create a Delta IV heavy, three boosters instead of one. Uh, the Falcon heavy is, if you're familiar with the Falcon 9 that SpaceX is flying, in fact, there's a launch tonight, I believe. Uh, in fact, right about now, uh, they took three of the Falcon 9 boosters, put them together, forming the Falcon Heavy, and then it was the uh, SpaceX Super Heavy booster, which is currently on the pad in Boca Chica, Texas, which will be the largest launch vehicle, even more powerful than the uh, Space Launch System. This will be a 14, 14 million pound thrust monster with 33 Raptor engines that will launch the uh, SpaceX Starship. And that is gonna be taking off if Elon Musk holds the plan before the end of the year. It might even beat Artemis I. That's how close it is to, to flying. So those are the three heavy vehicles that I mentioned. I'm not sure if that clears up your question, but. That means that they're just gonna fly faster, further? Bigger, more? bigger and more powerful. Uh, they're, they're really uh, quite ingenious inventions, especially coming out of uh, SpaceX. Those guys have blown me away with what they were able to do. I was not a big SpaceX fan when they first got the contract for the, uh, the, 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 the Crew Dragon to the space station, but boy, they really changed my mind. And the technology, they're just knocking down every barrier and just forging forward.
if they suffer a, a failure somewhere, they just pick up, fix the problem, and move on. Um, I wouldn't say they're m less cautious than NASA. They're just bolder, and I think that's what we need right now. Why do they keep focusing on the moon? I mean, now, because it's the closest? Yes, and, 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 and the reason right now that we're looking at establishing an Artemis base camp at the Lunar South Pole is we have discovered that there is just so, so much water, water ice, uh, at the South Pole of the Moon. If you can establish a base camp and find a way to recover that water and process it, you split water in half, you have oxygen and hydrogen. Oxygen you can breathe, uh, hydrogen and oxygen together form rocket fuel. You can have a very low gravity uh, launch site to explore the outer solar system. Now they were still talking years and years and years away from this ever happening, but the fact that we can get there within the next few years really determine what's down there at the South Pole, how we can begin extraction and begin a sustainable presence on the moon, that is intriguing. And it would lead to further human expansion throughout the solar system, especially on the Mars, which is the ultimate goal of the Artemis program. So with that, I want to thank Deborah uh, and the staff of the Wayne Library for their great support in organizing tonight's event. I want to thank all of you for attending uh, my talk on passing the torch from Apollo to Artemis. Thank you. Oh. Well, thank you. Thank you.